North Hollywood, California, and I'm here to visit the great site of Bart McLean, who played Colonel Peterson on I Dream of Genie. Are you a fan of I Dream of Genie? If so, stay tuned because I'm going to visit as many of the grave sites as I can find for the cast members of the show. Thanks for joining me on another trip to visit the most memorable cemeteries, memorials, and grave sites. To find this grave site, you enter through the front gates and make the first right, and then make the very next right, and then head to the center of the cemetery and look for the Egyptian arch. His final resting place is located not very far from the arch. His Find a Grave Memorial page has a GPS, which also helps. McLean was born on Christmas Day, December 25, 1902, in Columbia, South Carolina, and died on January 1st, New Year's Day, 1969. He died at the age of 66 in Santa Monica, California, from double pneumonia. The classic TV sitcom, I Dream of Jeannie, was originally on the air from 1965 to 1970, and McLean played General Martin Peterson on the show. During his long and impressive career, he appeared in nearly 175 movies and TV shows, but for fans of I Dream of Jeannie, he'll always best be remembered as General Peterson. This area where he's laid to rest is called the Hope Section, and straight ahead is the arch that I mentioned earlier. And as you can see, this is a pretty large section of the cemetery. And I hope he was a plane lover because Valhalla Cemetery is located right next door to Burbank Airport. Buried to the right of McLean is his wife, Charlotte Winters. She was an actress who appeared in more than 50 movies during her career. She lived to the age of 91 and died in Santa Monica, California on January 7, 1991. About 25 miles south of North Hollywood is Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City. And this is where two more cast members from I Dream of Jeannie are laid to rest. And I'm going to start by visiting the gravesite of actor Hayden Rourke, who played Colonel Dr. Alfred Bellows on the show. He's laid to rest up the hill in front of the mausoleum. And I really had to work for this one today. <laughs> the gravesite was covered in leaves and twigs. And there was no GPS. And so I just added one to make it a lot easier to find his grave if you visit in person. Rourke died in Toluca Lake, California at the age of 76 from multiple myeloma on August 19, 1987. He appeared in some 50 movies and TV shows, including classics like the 1959 Pillow Talk starring Doris Day and Rock Hudson. But like Barton McLean, he'll probably always best be remembered for his role in I Dream of Jeannie. According to Barbara Eaton in her autobiography, Jeannie Out of the Bottle, Rourke was openly gay and lived with his partner, director Justice Addis, until Addis' death in 1979. Addis was a movie and TV director and died on October 26, 1979, at the age of 62. I wasn't able to find a Wikipedia page for him, and his Find a Grave page says his burial details are unknown. So if any of you happen to know where he's laid to rest, please share with us down below in the comments section. While he wasn't buried with his partner, he was buried with his mother, Margaret Hayden Rourke. And I discovered that she was pretty famous herself. Back in the early 1900s, she was a suffragette and also an actress before she became famous in the fashion industry. She was America's first color forecaster or colorist. And during Herbert Hoover's presidential administration, she standardized the shades of red, white, and blue that are used in the American flag today. She also standardized the colors that are used in US military uniforms. She died on March 2nd, 1969 at the age of 85 and truly was an early fashion industry pioneer. Just a short walk from Rourke's grave to Section R at the west end of the cemetery is the gravesite of actress Emmeline or Emmeline Henry. She played Rourke's TV wife on the show, Amanda Bellows. Henry died in Palm Springs, California at the young age of 50 from a brain tumor on October 8, 1979. She appeared in dozens of movies and TV shows but like the others, will probably always best be remembered for her role as Amanda Bellows on the series. As you can see, she has one of the best views in the cemetery here on the side of the hill, looking west toward the ocean. To find her grave from the entrance gate, you make the first left and go up to the top of the hill past the grotto section on the left, 
Make another left and then go a short distance until you see section R on the right hand side. And our Find a Grave Memorial page does have a GPS to make it easy to find. Heading north back over the hill to Forest Lawn in the Hollywood Hills, I'm going to make another visit to actor Michael Ansara's gravesite, which is located just in front of the Courts of Remembrance, just to the left in the Homeward section. And Sarah was married to the star of the show, Barbara Eden, from 1958 to 1974. He played a few different characters on the show, including the Blue Jen, King Kamehameha, and Major Biff Jellico. He also directed at least one of the episodes. He appeared in more than 125 movies and TV shows during his career, and is probably best remembered for his role as Cochise on the TV Western series Broken Arrow that aired from 1956 to 1958. He also played Kane in the Buck Rogers in the 25th Century series and Kang in the Star Trek series. And Sarah died from Alzheimer's disease in Calabasas, California at the age of 91 on July 31st, 2013. One of the top 10 best-selling fiction writers of all time created and produced the show, which was based on the movie, The Brass Bottle, starring Tony Randall and Barbara Eden. The popular sitcom ran from 1965 to 1970. Sheldon also created and produced two other very popular TV series. The Patty Duke Show, which ran from 1963 to 66, and Heart to Heart, which ran from 1979 to 1984. During his career, he won an Academy Award, a Tony Award, and an Emmy Award. And if that weren't enough, later in life, he sold millions of books worldwide as a best-selling romance novelist. Sheldon died from pneumonia at the age of 89 in Rancho Mirage, California on January 30th, 2007. He was cremated and his ashes are interred here in the Sanctuary of Tenderness Courtyard at Westwood Village Memorial Park in Westwood, California. Actor Bill Daly played Captain Major Roger Healy on the show and lived to be 91 years old. He died on September 4, 2018 in Santa Fe, New Mexico and was cremated. His ashes were scattered and he has no final resting place to visit at this time. Actor Larry Hagman was the co-star of the show and he played Captain Major Tony Nelson in Jeannie's Master. He died from leukemia at the age of 81 on November 23, 2012 in Dallas, Texas. Like Daly, Hagman was also cremated. His ashes were scattered, and he has no final resting place to visit at this time. And I remember having a close encounter with Larry Hagman in the early 1970s, shortly after the series ended, and before he had even greater success as the star of the TV show Dallas, which was probably my favorite TV show of the 1980s. My brief encounter with Larry Hagman happened at the Thrifty Drugstore in downtown Palm Springs, California. As you can see, it's still here nearly 50 years later, but now it's a Rite Aid. It really blows my mind, as we used to say. It seems like it was just yesterday. I was standing in line at the checkout counter, and I turned around, and he was standing right behind me. He was standing there holding onto a shopping basket full of liquor. He had the most bloodshot eyes I've ever seen, and that's saying a lot because my eyes are always bloodshot because of severe allergies, and it seemed pretty clear that he was in no mood for conversation, so everyone in line gave him his privacy that day. His mother, actress Mary Martin, owned a home here in Palm Springs at the time, and so did Sidney Sheldon. So I just assumed that he was making an alcohol run for a party at one of their homes and he looked like he had already been partying for hours. So have you ever had an especially memorable celebrity encounter? If so, please share with all of us in the comments section. The only remaining main cast member from the show is Barbara Eden. She's now 88 years old, and I'm sure we all wish her many more happy years. And this week, I'd like to thank my latest Patreon supporter, Ernie Comstock. Thank you, Ernie, for supporting this channel with your generous contribution. So if you enjoyed today's vlog, please give it a thumbs up and share with a friend. And if you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing and then clicking the bell icon to be notified when I upload future videos like this one. And if you did like today's video, I have plenty more that you might be interested in watching, like these two here. So until our next trip to the graveyard, thanks for sharing the memories, everyone.
city of San Francisco is situated on the northern end of a hilly peninsula. On one side is the Pacific Ocean, on the other, the vast bay of San Francisco. The city's founders were the Spanish settlers who came with Portola in 1769, but its builders were the adventurers who flocked to it during the gold rush days of 49. Adventurers from all the world who turned the quiet mission village into a metropolis. Today, it is a beautiful and great city with massive towers of steel and stone standing as symbols of its progress. With her city custom cash card, Rashida earns cash back. The city's main business thoroughfare is Market Street, and few streets in America can boast more traffic and activity. Crowded streetcars constantly rush in pairs up and down its four sets of tracks. Curious sights to strangers are the tram cars which are turned around by hand on circular tables in the pavement. These cars, which are light enough for two men to push, are hill climbing cars. They are drawn by moving cables that run beneath the street, and in them, San Franciscans go roller coasting up and down their hilly highways. San Francisco is built almost entirely on hills, and some of them are so steep that stairways take the place of streets. Automobiles are parked at precarious angles, and you often wonder just how slight a push it would take to send some toppling to the bottom. One of the most celebrated sections of San Francisco is Chinatown, the largest Chinese community outside of the Orient. Here, the exotic odors and ways of old Cathay still exist. Oriental lanterns are the street lights and many ornate curving roofs springs the skyline. Most attractive is the telephone exchange, built in classic Chinese style. There are more than 20,000 permanent Chinese residents in Chinatown, many of them American-born. Chinatown appeals particularly to shoppers, who spend hours browsing about in the attractive stores among the exotic wares from the Orient. To many, Chinatown is most attractive at night when neon signs blaze and shop windows are brightly lighted. San Francisco is the proud possessor of the two greatest bridges in the world. The longest single span in history is flung across the fabulous Golden Gate, the entrance to San Francisco Bay. The distance between the towers is four-fifths of a mile, more than 700 feet longer than any other single bridge span in the world. The longest bridge in the world is the Bay Bridge, connecting the city of Oakland on the mainland with San Francisco on the peninsula. The bridge which caught 77 million dollars is eight and a quarter miles long and crosses the largest landlocked harbor in the world. It has two levels, the lower for trucks and electric trains, the upper for six lanes of fast-moving automobiles. San Francisco owes its existence to the vast bay and its great port. The Embarcadero, the famed waterfront street, is faced for miles with row upon row of splendid docks and up and down it rumble railway cars and trucks carrying the cargoes of ships that sail the seven seas. One of the most romantic parts of the waterfront is the International Settlement, the Barbary Coast of old San Francisco. 
once famed as the wickedest spot in America, it is today only a street of a few cafes and many memories. In the days gone by, men from across the ocean brought to San Francisco taste for foreign things to eat and drink, and ever since, our good food has been famous. The most picturesque part of the waterfront is Fisherman's Wharf, with its miniature harbor, where the fishing fleet waits for the tide. It's fashionable to dine at Fisherman's Wharf, where giant crabs and shellfish are served fresh from boiling cauldrons in the open. Fisherman's Wharf, with inside of the Golden Gate, is San Francisco's beautiful yacht harbor. Great craft from faraway lands tie up from time to time in this truly cosmopolitan port. At one pier, bobbing up and down, is a gilded teakwood junk that made the crossing from China in 87 days. And almost next to it, a silver metal flying clipper prepares to take off on the same journey and to reach its destination in less than six days. The great flying boat circles the bay and then slips away into the clouds that herald the coming of San Francisco's fogs. The fogs, which creak in from the Pacific to blanket the city with mist, are world famous. People think of fogs as nuisances, but in San Francisco they are not. For during the months from May until October, when almost no rain falls, they cover the land with a gentle veil of moisture, bring new light to the trees and flowers, and keep down the summer temperatures of the great city. Experience personalized city in America has more attractive residential areas than has San Francisco. They hug the shores of the bay, or ramble in well-ordered patterns up and down the sides of the many hills. Empire builders reared marble mansions on the tops of the hills, and other citizens erected dignified homes along fine avenues. Rows of small houses line many streets, their attractive architecture contrasting greatly with the gorgeousness of some of the earliest homes of the city. Most lovable of the city's inhabitants is Cicero, crack master of Golden Gate Park. His friendliness, even with strangers, is typical of all San Franciscans. His special domain is a pond among the dwarf cypresses and pines of the tea garden that was a gift to the people of San Francisco from the Emperor Meiji of Japan. A perfect oriental garden in a setting 6,000 miles from home. A garden that for more than half a century has delighted thousands in this city beside the lake. Among the trees of Portsmouth Square is the only monument to the memory of Robert Louis Stevenson. On Sutro Heights, in a garden of 60 years ago, weathered stone figures gazed down upon the green trees of Golden Gate Park and upon the white sand of San Francisco's magnificent beach. San Franciscans are justly proud of their many public buildings, for they are among the finest of any city in America. The Palace of Fine Arts is a beautiful reminder of the Panama Pacific Expedition of 1915. Mission Dolores, founded by Guinipero Serra, has watched the pageant of San Francisco since the beginning. The marble Legion of Honor houses treasures of tapestry, painting, and sculpture. There is a certain beauty even in the massive walls and severe architecture of the United States Mint. But the pride of San Francisco is the Civic Center, where a monumental group of buildings have been created to serve and beautify the city. They are placed around a spacious park, planted with beds of colorful flowers and alleys of trees, where the idle while away their time in the sunshine. In the center of this group stands the City Hall, one of the most beautiful municipal buildings in the world. Its proud dome, rising more than 300 feet above the street, majestically overlooks the fascinating and romantic metropolis of Western America. 
Fan Fan Disco. We owe him. 
One smile from you and he gets that old sinking feeling in his chopped liver. Well, I'll try, but I don't know if he'll give us any more credit. Oh, wait. Put on your glasses. No, Greta, I don't want to come on. We don't want you winding up in Kansas City. All right. Bye. <laughs> Jacket. That's Mr. Brooklyn. 
Now, a lot of people are deceived by his attire. I don't understand it myself, but I suppose with all these many enterprises, his oil wells in Oklahoma, oil. ranches in Texas,
along. Yes. Why, Mr. Brinkman. Where are you? Well, it's so nice of you to call. Tom Brinkman. I saw your friend a while ago. Well, I guess you could call it an explanation, but I don't know of what. <laughs> If you really feel that bad, you could make it up by having dinner with me tonight. Why, I'd love it. Of course, I hate to leave my two girlfriends here alone. But that would be wonderful. You must to bring along some of the friends for you and Mo. <laughs> well, fine. Then we could all have cocktails here first. Stay sexy? All right. Bye for now. Oh, Mike, we've done it. Hi. Wait till you hear the news. We just heard Tom Brookman called. He's bringing over a couple of friends for cocktails, and then we're all going out to dinner. And it's worse. I met his friends. Did you? You're the greatest. I take back all the awful things I ever said about you, even the ones that were true. And <laughs> what were his friends like? You know, it's amazing. They're just like him. Now look here, 
and he claimed morbid manner for himself. But that's the silly superstition. <laughs>
was my best friend. You see, we went to college. Oh, Jibubu, Bobo's best friend. Jibubu, Jibubu. Jibubu, Boo-Boo, and Bobo's best friend. Jibubu. 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 Sugar Blues, I, I believe the dance is in. <laughs> so it is, Baba. May I see you home there? Oh, no, no, no. I'm seeing Baba home. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Boo and Bobo, but I have other plans. Ready, baby? <laughs> Pasadena Playhouse, uh, Jenny kissed me. I understand it's going great. Yeah, they're doing very well indeed. Uh, well, it's, it's a real pleasure much. having you here tonight. Hey.